Hi, everybody. Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for our Urban Wild Columbia River Chum Salmon virtual event. My name is Tanya Mickelson, and I'm the events manager at Columbia Land Trust. Before I introduce our program, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items to make sure you know how to participate in tonight's event. Um, at any time during the webinar, you'll have the opportunity to submit your questions to our presenters. Um, to do so, simply type your question into the Q&A box found at the bottom of your control panel. Um, you can also use your chat feature found there as well. As time allows, our presenters will address as many questions as they can during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. And we will be recording this webinar and we'll share the link out after this event as well. Um, I'd first like to acknowledge the resiliency of indigenous peoples and that no matter where you're tuning in from tonight, you are on native land. Um, getting us started with to our presentation is Columbia Land Trust Executive Director, Glenn Lamb. Glenn has been active with Columbia Land Trust since its founding in 1990 and became an executive director in 1999. Welcome, Glenn. Thank you all so much for joining us. Um, I, I wish we were all together, but uh, here we are. And I will give some introductory comments about Chum Salmon and describe how a critically important spawning property was conserved. It's quite a story. And then I will turn it over to Brad Garner, fisheries biologist for the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, who will describe the plight of chum salmon, why this particular property is so important, and how fisheries biologists are monitoring the fish in the Columbia River, including genetic testing. And finally, we'll watch a short underwater video of chum actually spawning. It's really thrilling. And we'll finish with time for questions and answers. In the way of background, for those of you who are new to Columbia Land Trust, for 30 years now, we have been conserving the very nature of the Northwest through sound science and strong relationships. We're a positive collaborative group. We work within a band about 50 miles north and south of the Columbia River from the east side of the Cascade Mountains all the way to the Pacific Ocean. This map shows the area in which we work and the different colored areas are our priority conservation areas. Uh, where we're doing the most intensive work. So historically, we've done this work primarily by owning, restoring, and stewarding land. And the areas seen in bright yellow in this map are the areas that we have acquired. It's now uh, more than 70 square miles um, that we've conserved. And when I say we, it's, it's we're a member-supported organization. It's just all of us that are, that are doing this work. And it's been absolutely thrilling. But several years ago, we adopted a new conservation agenda. And when we say agenda, we mean it's a, a, a list of shared things that we all want to ensure happen. And one of the purposes, one of the reasons we've done that um, is we wanna broaden the number of people and organizations that are actively involved in this work. We do that in part through our Backyard Habitat Certification Program, which we administer jointly with the Portland Audubon Society. But we also continue to just acquire and manage more and more critical land for nature. And we invite others to participate as well. We believe, and we've seen this happen, this has really been thrilling work, that person by person, group by group, business by business, positive change can occur that will lead to mutual thriving of all people and all nature. And this philosophy of mutual thriving has long been held by the people indigenous to this place. And tonight's story is an example of how some people came together to ensure that a critical property is conserved and now managed. So one of the reasons that we feel our region needs a conservation agenda is because the challenges facing the nature of the Northwest are so widespread and complex. And the subject of today's webinar is a great example of that. Historically, the Columbia River has supported some of the richest salmon runs in the world. We all know that, including these five species of salmon. And it ends up that Pacific salmon have been the food base for much of what lives in the watershed, so much so that they're often called a keystone species. Now, I don't know how many of you may have been aware that as many as 137 other species are documented as being dependent upon salmon. 41 are mammals, including orcas. Now, this is another thing I don't know very many people know, but the southern pod of orcas that are so threatened, their primary food source is salmon coming from the Columbia River. So things that we do right here at home in the Columbia watershed are critical to species like 
orcas, bears, river otters, 89 species of birds, including bald eagles, Caspian terns, and grebes, also reptiles and amphibians. Human societies were built and sustained since time immemorial that depend on salmon. So the typical life cycle of these fish, just to review, as shown on this chart, and historically, of course, they're born in spawning gravels along every major tributary and many smaller streams throughout the huge Columbia River watershed. And after some time rearing in their freshwater rivers, they head to the mouth of the Columbia where they acclimatize to salt water and begin their ocean voyage. Now, salmon from the Columbia River can travel thousands of miles over the several years in the ocean phase of their lives, extending all the way to Southeast Alaska. This map gives a little bit of an example of where they go. This is truly one of the great migrations of the world. And frankly, for a lot of us, I know, the part that makes it seem most stunning is that they find their way back to the Columbia acclimatize back again to be a freshwater species and make their way back to the same spawning gravels where they were born to repeat the cycle. So the trouble is that in the last couple of hundred years, Columbia River salmon stocks have plummeted from millions and millions of salmon to tens of thousands, or in some cases, even complete extinction. And that's due to the combined impacts of dams. This is Bonneville Dam here. Also harvests, habitat loss, in changes in ocean conditions. Loss of salmon would be devastating to so much life in the Northwest and beyond. And this is the chart that just sort of shows over the last couple hundred years, how we've gone from millions and tens of millions down to tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands. So we need to do whatever we can to help them out. And fast forward to a day in 2001, when I received a phone call from a woman named Mary Wood telling me that her father had recently passed away. Now I knew him because just a few years before this call, he had walked into my office telling me that he wanted to donate a property for conservation, which he did while he was still alive. But now that he was gone, other property that he owned was subject to disposition of his estate. And this other property is shown, uh, it's the starred property that's right there in the middle, um, uh, that the icon, the uh, cursor is uh, circling there. So what I didn't know was that that property um, within the city limits of Vancouver, Washington, and there you can see that's the, the property in yellow and that's the I-205 bridge just off to the left. Um, this property was inside the city limits near Interstate 205 bridge. And Mary Wood told me on the phone that unknown to almost anyone, one of the most vital populations of chum salmon in the entire Columbia River Basin still spawned right there in the Columbia River where, where fresh springs emanate right from the shore. So as you can see to the property just to the east, um, uh, that's very highly um, uh, zoned, it could be very densely populated, and it could even have a marina. And if that were to happen on this property, it would surely wipe out one of the very last thriving chum populations. So you see, one of the things that was also unique about this property is that there are springs that pop out right at the spawning gravels and the integrity of the land and the springs was all tied together for salmon survival. And to make a long story short, this family ended up donating much of the land to Columbia Land Trust to protect the fish habitat and for nearly 20 years now, we have managed that land to stay undeveloped. And in addition, we've removed aggressive plants, not native to the area and planted native plants. Okay, so here's a scene from up above on the bank above the Columbia. I now want you to use your imagination. I want you to walk with me on this property. We come over to a bluff that goes fairly steeply down to the Columbia. We need to kind of be using our hands to maneuver our way down this rocky bank. And we find ourselves on the shore of the Columbia. It's a cold day. You kind of are glad you have some gloves on. Further out, you see Canada geese floating along the shore. And up close, you see some small waves. Suddenly, you become aware that these are not regular waves, but these are salmon, completing the final act of their lives depositing eggs and fertilizing them 
right there in front of you, can, completing the final act of their lives, depositing eggs, fertilizing them to continue the amazing cycle of life that has depended on this place for millions of years. So that's the stage that we've set here. And for the remainder of the presentation, uh, I'm gonna turn this over to Brad Garner, fisheries biologist with the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, who's been leading the chum recovery efforts for the state to bring this property and the chum salmon story more to life. Thank you, Brad. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Glenn. Um, hello, everyone. Good evening. Uh, as Glenn stated, I'm a uh, fisheries biologist for the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, particularly, I am the chum salmon biologist for the lower Columbia and its tributaries within the state of Washington. Uh, my primary responsibilities are monitoring and managing the recovery efforts for chum salmon, uh, which is what I'll be talking about this evening. Um, I'll begin with some info and history of chum salmon in general, and also uh, within our region. Uh, chum are the second largest Pacific salmon after the Chinook salmon. Uh, they are most widely distributed from Western North America across the polar regions and Eastern Asia. Uh, when they enter freshwater during their spawning runs, they developed a particular tiger stripe marking as you can see here on this male. Uh, this is more prominent in the males than it is the females. Uh, they also have a typical hooked jaw as other spawning salmon do. Uh, but one distinctive uh, characteristic of chum salmon is they have canine-like teeth, which you can see in this picture here. Uh, chum salmon uh, were historically abundant to the Columbia River. Uh, in the early 1900s, uh, some occurrences uh, such as dam construction, levees and dikes for flood control uh, impeded uh, salmon migrations of all types and destroyed some of the uh, uh, spawning uh, grounds. Uh, harvest uh, was an issue um, with the industrial fishing methods as well as timber harvesting activities, uh, degraded water quality, and um, also uh, destroyed many of the chum salmon spawning grounds. One notable occurrence was the completion of Bonneville Dam uh, in 1937. Um, this effectively uh, impeded uh, chum salmon migrations up the Columbia, but it also flooded uh, prime chum spawning habitat above the dam. And come 1940, uh, there was, was seen a precipitous decline of chum salmon within the Columbia. Uh, this continued through 1960 and the chum have uh, not recovered since. Uh, these fish were listed um, as threatened under the Endangered Species Act in 1999. Uh, despite fish passage improvements and harvest restrictions, chum remain at low levels, leading to the assumption that critical habitat is lacking in the Columbia River for chum salmon. We've identified uh, critical spawning habitat for for chum within the Columbia. Um, I have these depicted in the three sites listed here. Um, chum do spawn in other areas uh, within the Columbia, but these areas have multiple sites, each where chum spawn in relatively high numbers. Uh, all of these sites um, have one particular characteristic in common, which is groundwater upwelling uh, with springs and seeps. Uh, this groundwater is rich in oxygen and is also warmer than the surface water um, of the Columbia River. Chum prefer these areas uh, for their spawning grounds, and this ties into their life history strategy. Uh, chum are what we refer to as last in and first out. Um, chum begin their spawning migrations and reach their grounds much later uh, than other salmon within the Columbia. Uh, chum will reach their spawning grounds uh, around November. Um, they'll continue to come in December, and a few will still be seen um, spawning in early January. Uh, chum will um, uh, instinctively um, navigate to these groundwater upwellings and they seem to prefer, the, prefer these sites over other gravels uh, within the hydro system. Uh, they lay their eggs in this gravel. Um, chum eggs are relatively large and they develop very quickly. Um, these um, eggs um, are bathed in the rich oxygen groundwater uh, and they develop quickly in that warm groundwater as well. Uh, the fry emerge 
um, very early uh, in the season. And unlike other salmon who will spend a year or more in their natal streams before they make their migration to the ocean, chum leave immediately um, after leaving the gravel um, and head to the estuary for a brief residence time before they enter the ocean. This is what we um, refer to as the adults being the last in and the juvenile fry being the first out. Uh, these areas are where we do part of our monitoring of chum salmon, which I'll describe now. Um, to assess the status of these salmon, uh, we first have to get our hands on them. Uh, one of the major methods for capturing salmon in the Columbia River is um, by seining. Uh, here we, you can see that we are setting a seine, uh, encircling um, salmon that we know are using these spawning grounds here. Um, after we um, set the net, we um, jump out of the boat and corral the fish in these nets and do it slowly as to not um, stress them too much. And we gradually bring the net in by hand. Uh, once we have the fish um, calm, uh, we bring our sampling equipment over with the boat and we start processing the fish uh, for our study. Uh, what you can see here is a large male chum salmon. Uh, you can see the distinctive um, tiger stripe pattern on his side, um, the hooked jaws, it's typical in other salmon, but those big canine teeth are showing nice and bright and white there on this male. Um, you can see in the foreground here uh, with the red caps and the blue box, uh, those are where we keep um, DNA samples from tissue samples we take from the fish. This is an important part of our study uh, where we monitor um, the, the genetic um, structure of this population. Uh, this is important for us to determine where um, fish are coming from. Um, we have other uh, restoration efforts and reintroduction efforts within the area uh, such as hatchery production, as well as artificial spawning grounds. Uh, and when we are evaluating our reintroduction efforts, it's nice to know where these fish come from. And DNA uh, from parent to um, offspring gives us a, a lot of information when these fish are returning to their spawning grounds. Uh, here you can see a female. Uh, this is a, a slightly less than average size female here. There's not that quite a disparaging um, size difference between males and females is these two pictures here. Um, but she has the, the distinctive tiger stripe pattern of chum salmon, uh, not such a prominent hook jaw or teeth like the males and that's typical of females. Uh, one thing you can see here is that blue rectangle um, on her side near the back of her head. Um, that is a tagging method that we use to assess the abundance of fish on the spawning grounds. Um, this is a, uh, a metal tag that's originally used for livestock ear tagging, but it has a unique number and we apply these to every adult we find on the spawning grounds. Uh, we do this on multiple events and when we capture fish, we look at the ratio of tag versus untagged fish and that gives us an assessment of the abundance of uh, the chum on the spawning grounds. Um, here uh, it shows we're processing a male uh, I think this is a video. Uh, yeah, here we go. Um, so um, what we're doing here is we keep him in water. Uh, you know, fish suffocate when they're out of water and we work quickly. He just took a length of the fish there. Other crew members are recording the data. Um, he's applying a tag to that apercal plate, that uniquely identifiable tag that I mentioned there. You can see it in pink there. Now he's removing scales. Uh, and if you can see from the portion of the fish that he's removing scales from there, those are the oldest scales on the fish. Those were with the fish when it um, first began its life and they stay with the fish throughout its life. And those are the best scales to use to age a fish. Uh, we age fish by counting the rings on the scales, much like you count the rings to age a tree. And then he gently handles the fish and returns it back to the river. So here um, in this figure, I have the uh, abundance estimates, the number of fish that we've seen in these three areas uh, with those major spawning grounds. Um, you can see fluctuation between years. You can also see the commonality between runs at all sites in a given year. Uh, this is typical for salmon runs uh, that you see. And this oscillating pattern is also typical in salmon runs. It's not so important to look at what's in any one given year. Um, the most important thing is to look at trends over time. Um, how, do we, how do we see 
uh, if we see a trend of increase or decrease over a long period of time. 10 years of data is good, 20 years of data is better. Uh, 20 years plus is better. Uh, the main um, thing I want to look at, want you to look at here is the magnitude of the abundances in these three sites. And if you notice in that lower site, um, there is a significantly higher magnitude in the abundance at this site. Uh, this, is, this area routinely has high numbers of chum and they're selecting to spawn here. This area includes the Woods Hole area that we're discussing tonight. And this speaks to the value of this site and the chum salmon and how unique and special it is. Great, thank you so much, Brad. Um, I think that concludes our formal presentation. Uh, so now we're gonna go ahead and show the video that Glenn referenced um, earlier and you can see what's happening under the water. It's early November, the chum salmon are running in the streams near Squamish, and I've just arrived at a spring-fed channel where the chum are spawning. I get comfortable and start to watch. Below me, a female chum is digging her nest, one sweep at a time, where she'll lay her eggs. Her narrow body with its strong, dark, horizontal bar distinguishes her from the larger male beside her. I lower my underwater camera and begin to watch another female chum flick her tail as she digs her nest in the gravel. She disappears into a confusing swarm of other salmon that swirl around her nest. They're all males waiting to fertilize her eggs, but the males are different sizes and have different patterns that are confusing. The big, thick-bodied males with prominent vertical streaks are easy to identify, but there are also smaller males marked with a dark horizontal bar and paler vertical streaks, and at a distance they look somewhat like the female. But all these spawning males, large and small, have something in common, hook-like jaws and large canine teeth that form as the chum leave the ocean and enter the river. With these dog-like teeth, males fight on the spawning grounds for the right to mate with females. Suddenly, a smoke-like cloud appears in the nest. That's got to be male sperm. So the female must have just dropped some eggs. I quietly move the camera forward to the side of the nest. Across the nest, several males hover. The female, slender in comparison, arrives beside the males then moves forward. In a remarkable moment, she bellies to the gravel, gapes, males rush to her side, and nothing happens. She swims off. A minute later, she's back. And again, she comes forward. Bellies to the gravel, mouth agape, Males rush in and, oh wow. I am just blown away. I run it back in slow motion to see it again. It all happened so quickly. Oh <laughs> wow. Her eggs flow and immediately they're hit with a shower of sperm from a male. <laughs> and another male comes in under her, likely spraying sperm too. As the cloud clears, she returns again. Flanked by two males, all mouths agape, a cloud of sperm rises above what must be more eggs. Three more times she returns and three more times she lays eggs. Each time, males jockey for position.
And then the egg laying is over and she begins to sweep gravel on the eggs. They need to be buried deeply to protect them from stream predators and erosion. Her life's work, done. Her remaining days, few. But with luck, the gravel will be a safe home for her eggs through the winter months to come. And the young salmon that rise from the stream bed will find their way to the sea. And then, years later, return here. And the cycle of life will continue on. Wow, I just found that more stunning every time I watch that. I um, uh, hope you all had a good view of that. And uh, I um, um, wanted to uh, just point out in this slide here, uh, this was just this last Monday when I went out to join the uh, fishery staff that was out doing the monitoring. And I saw these, these two eggs that were right there uh, uh, on the ground, it was a slightly low tide, and um, and and uh, these are still vital eggs that were that were right there. That a few that hadn't been buried. Each female, I'm told by fishery staff, uh, produces I think Brad, isn't it 2,700 or so roughly um, eggs? Uh, yeah, that's a good average. Yeah, yeah and depending um, on the size of the female, they can range anywhere from 2,000 to as much as 4,000. But the average we see around here is about 2,700. Like that. So there may very well have been, you know, a couple thousand of eggs that were buried right at the spot that I arrived at. And the spring water was coming up right there, keeping it wet. And I have to say that just off to the side where it was a little bit deeper water were a whole flock of mergansers who I'm sure were, they're a diving duck that were probably very interested in the, the eggs that were in that area. But I just uh, wanted to point out that's what we were looking at here. Yeah, thank you for that, Glenn. Um, and before I miss the chance, I do want to clarify that that video um, was not taken at Woods Landing. That is actually taken near Squamish, uh, British Columbia, and by videographer Bob Turner. Um, so we're grateful to have had the opportunity to use that video and to share with all of you what's happening behind the scenes. Um, so we have some really great questions. I think I'll just start so we can hopefully answer as many of them as possible. Um, but we have a question here from Janet, and her question is, how is climate change affecting the recovery of chum salmon, and how are changes in water temperature on the Columbia affecting the chum? Uh, that's a really great question. We're still asking that question to ourselves, um, and how we might assess how climate change is affecting the recovery of chum salmon. Um, uh, yeah, climate change is it's an interesting beast to deal with when you're a, when you're a biologist. Um, um, it, the obvious effects of warmer water um, create stress on the fish when they're making their migrations, as well as when the juveniles are rearing uh, in warmer water. Uh, things like parasite load can increase. Um, you know, warmer water has less dissolved oxygen, um, and um, you know we've. We've noticed in some of our populations where the war water is warmer in the summer and getting even warmer at times um, that there's a parasite that may be affecting the population. Uh, we're still assessing to what degree that parasite might be uh, affecting the population. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great question. Lots of unknowns and we're definitely looking at that. Great. Um... So have you identified any other waterfront property in the area where critical spawning is happening, um, aside from those three points on the map? Or are those kind of the, the three that are there? Brad, do you want to give that I can a shot? Start with, um... Uh, yes, there is other critical spawning happening in the area. Um, 
there's a, another site that, that um, has almost the same number of uh, fish on that spawning ground very near that area. Um, so that area is uh, prime with groundwater uh, upwelling and the chum find it better than we do. And when we see them there, we, um, uh, we assess those sites, uh, and the magnitude of the chum using it. And we add that to our potential sites for monitoring. Great. And Glenn, maybe this is a question for you. Do well, Can I take a shot at that last one also? Yeah. Yeah. It's Absolutely. that, um, I, I just, um, um, and, and Brad, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but I, what I, what I think one of the things that's most remarkable about, about this particular property is that it hasn't had dredge spoils or riprap or other kinds of impacts. Um, so these spawning gravels are still there. And when you go yes. up and down the river on both sides of the river, um, it's, it's unfortunately, there, there, there isn't really other waterfront property in the area that that hasn't been impacted in some way where springs are coming up. Um, so they're, they're really, to my knowledge, there aren't any plans um, to try to acquire other land around this uh, for this purpose because the unique environmental conditions are really just there on this property. Now, down in the, in the estuary, further down towards the Pacific Ocean, there are a number of streams, uh, thinking particularly um, Germany Creek, Abernathy Creek, um, the Grays River, um, that do have additional spawning areas. And Columbia Land Trust also has conserved and owned lands at those spawning areas that are further downstream. So, uh, but these, I think, Brad, these are the only ones in the Columbia itself that are still viable. Uh, for the most part, true. Yeah, I'm sorry, Tanya, you were going to say. That was the question I was going to ask you, so you, oh, okay. you're on it. Um, so, Brad, this might be a great question for you. Is there hydrology data available to identify um, potential sites that might exist in the lower Columbia uh, for restoration for chum salmon spawning? Mm. Uh, there is. It uh, depends on the entity that has collected that data. Um, we have some ourselves and it, it's a bit, I, I won't say it's piecemeal, uh, it is available. Uh, we have used um, data from uh, other institutions and other governmental agencies to identify sites, uh, spawning ground sites, and um, also monitoring the, uh, the chemistry and uh, the physics of those sites as well. Um, so, um, yes. Great. So some other questions are, so what do chum salmon eat? Um, that depends on at what stage they are in their life cycle. Uh, if we begin um, after the eggs hatch, um, juvenile chum salmon will eat insects and freshwater invertebrates. Uh, that's same for the river and the estuary. Um, as they as they grow into adults in the ocean, uh, they become uh, opportunistic feeders. They, they'll eat other fish, um, copepods, mollusks, squid, if they can find them. Uh, chum salmon reside in the upper part of the ocean. They, do, they don't dive uh, for their food. But um, yeah, those are general food items for chum salmon. Is that similar to what the other species of salmon in the Pacific yeah, it's very eat similar. as well? Yes. Um, so how long do the eggs take before they hatch? Uh, it, it varies um, by, mostly by water temperature. Uh, thermal units of the water around the uh, spawning ground. Um, and uh, the eggs are laid, you know, in November, in December, we start uh, seeing fry uh, in early spring. We'll see them in February. Um, so that's about the time frame, uh, but it, it, it varies quite a bit, but it's roughly uh, between those months. Brad, Brad, can I ask, how, how big are the chum salmon when they start heading down the Columbia? Uh, the fry, um, so the fry start moving um, right after they absorb their uh, yolk sac. 
uh, they start migrating down, they'll be uh, really small, um, uh, 40, 50, 60 millimeters. Um, you know, if you're, if you're not, um, don't use metric that often, that's like, uh, you know, inch or a little more, uh, maybe out to like two inches, uh, but they're, they're really small. They're, they're called fry for a reason. <laughs> and, not and, and, and they're able to, I, I'm imagining them as being incredibly vulnerable to uh, predators and, you know, sort of what might those predators be and how many of them do you think make it all the way out to the ocean out of those that, I mean, in that segment of their life, do you have any idea what the survival is like? Uh, I don't know. I don't have a good idea of the survival. Um, that varies by hydro system as well. Uh, the main stem Columbia uh, fry will have a different survival to the, you know, through the, to the estuary and then to the ocean as say that Gray's River you have mentioned earlier um, uh, for various reasons. Um, uh, Chum, uh, in, in their natural system, um, are, are a major food base for other species, uh, other fish. Um, you know, they have their niche and they spawn at different times than other salmon. Uh, there's fry migrated at different times. So they're, you know, in that natural system of all the species of salmon, there's a, there's a, there's a wide range of nutrients and prey and availability uh, throughout the year um, to provide that dynamic food web um, that is a healthy natural system. Um, uh, common predator, I mean, even uh, bird species, um, like you mentioned earlier, the, the diving ducks, the, the herons, the, uh, all of the um, um, small fish eating birds and other fish uh, prey on them uh, on their way out to the ocean. Uh, along those same lines, we have a question from Steve Cook here. Uh, do we know what they eat when they're out in the ocean and who eats them when they're in the ocean? Um, yes, when they're out in the ocean, uh, they're, they're opportunistic. Um, they come across a fish smaller than them, they'll eat it. Uh, they eat copepods, mollusks, and squid when they can come across them. Um, when they're out in the ocean, what eats them? Uh, orcas, dolphins. Um, when they're near shore, uh, it's seals and sea lions. Um, it, it's, not a, it's not as much of a spectacle on the Columbia, but when they're making their spawning migrations uh, in places like Alaska and uh, Canada, you can see bears picking them off the, uh, um, the spawning grounds, but that, that's not something we see here. Um, when they're on their spawning grounds in the, in the Columbia, uh, probably the main predator would be uh, seals and sea lions. Great. Uh, so have chum been raised in hatcheries or are they all natives? And does this have any implications for the species? Uh, yes, it has, um, it drives our uh, restoration efforts. Uh, we have a hatchery program where we, we actually take fish from this site and we spawn them in the hatchery and we use that in our reintroduction efforts. Um, that's why it's important for us to know if it's a strong run if it, if what the abundance is, what the health of the population, um, where with that genetic sampling, uh, what's the origin of those fish? Did it come from one of our um, hatchery programs? We also have um, artificial spawning grounds in several of the tributaries to the Columbia. Uh, we, the genetic uh, sampling from those fish tells us when, when they subsequently return, when the juveniles with offspring from those fish return to the system, we know where they came from. We know how effective or ineffective our recovery efforts are. Uh, based, uh, a lot of that's based on the origin of the returning adults. Great, thank you. Uh, this is a great question. Why are they called chum salmon? Um, it's from the, uh, it's from the, um, I'm trying to think of the spelling. It's from the native uh, Chinook language, T-Z-U-M, some, um, and uh, yeah, I think some people believe uh, it was because they were used as bait for chumming other fish. That's not true. Um, I've heard some other things. Uh, They're also known as dog salmon, right? If people hear yes. dog salmon, it's the same. Yes, for those canine teeth. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So are chum salmon good for eating uh, by humans and 
are they commonly, um, are they fished as much as the other species? Um, not locally. Uh, it depends on where the chum are uh, as far as, and it depends on your taste as whether you consider them good for eating. Uh, they are uh, people that like um, your, the strong um, tasting salmon like Chinook. Uh, if, your favorite, if your favorite salmon to eat is Chinook, um, and you don't like, say, coho or something like that, you probably won't like chum. Um, chum are a little milder flavor. They don't have the strong salmon flavor. They don't have as much oil in their um, tissue. Um, and they are, uh, a lot of people smoke them because they don't like um, the flavor of chum. Now that depends on uh, where you are too. That's if you're local. Um, if you're in, say, uh, if you're in the US and you're from Alaska, you have a different opinion. Uh, chum are more readily eaten um, in, in Alaska. But if you move all the way over to Asia, um, they're even more readily consumed. Um, Russia, um, China, Japan, um, uh, all uh, have a, a very strong market for chum, even chum eggs. Chum eggs are eaten as caviar uh, in Asia. Interesting, thank you. Uh, well, I know we're just down to a few more minutes here of tonight's presentation. So just a reminder that if anyone has a question they want to sneak in, um, now would be the time to do so. And we have a question here um, regarding the Bonneville Dam. So the Bonneville Dam seems to claim that the salmon are easily able to get through the dam in order to spawn. Is that not really true? Easily. Um, chum salmon are... Um, they are very strong swimmers. Um, dams in general um, are, are an impediment to fish, even if they have fish passage. Uh, fish can't always find the ladders um, at a dam. Uh, once they do, and if they do make it above the dam, uh, salmon aren't accustomed to um, lake-like habitat. Uh, they might have trouble navigating. Uh, they may have trouble finding, their, finding a spawning ground in that type of habitat that's been created above the dam. Um, there's lots of factors other than just um, if the fish can make it above the dam. There's, there's lots of things to consider when it comes to um, the success of a salmon making it to the spawning ground. Yeah, Brad, I really appreciate it. It was uh, when we were first uh, meeting and talking about this that I did not realize how much the reservoir behind the Bonneville Dam probably eliminated um, significant amounts of chum uh, spawning uh, habitat. So again, like you say, it wasn't just the block that was created by the dam itself, but that it it inundated places so that uh, yes. it, it overnight um, re greatly reduced the places that chum uh, could spawn. Yes, this is true. Um, historically, um, chum salmon, like I'd mentioned, they're strong swimmers, but they're not strong jumpers. Um, not like uh, Chinook or Coho or Steelhead, especially. They don't. They they can they can travel long distances, and they do in Alaska and, and over in Asia. They travel long distances on their migrations. Um, but if there's any natural barrier or any man-made barrier, they just can't seem to get over it. They they can't jump as well as those other species. Um, and historically. Um, Salado Falls near the Dalles, Oregon, was a natural barrier. Um, it's flooded now, uh, but uh, in good water years, chum could get over it, and most years they couldn't. Um, just as, what, a, a, as an aside. <laughs> yeah, one of the things that I just come away from hearing you talk about uh, this and from being able to, to go down to this site and, and understand it is just, man, how delicate, how delicate nature is, right? How how many things are so critically important um, to species, but yet how they may be invisible to us. Um, you know, they may not be things that we obviously can see. And, and I just am so grateful in this particular case that the, the family that happened to own that property was aware enough of what was going on in that particular location that uh, they stepped forward to do something like this. And um, mm. it just it just makes me aware when I, I talked earlier about the backyard habitat program and our conservation agenda and our desire to really get more and more people involved is that we're we're counting on all of us right to be the eyes and ears to pay attention to 
understand what nature is around us um, and to observe and report. And uh, um, uh, these, are, these are amazing life forces that are out there that are also incredibly delicate and vulnerable. And uh, uh, Brad, your, your information about this site just really drives that point home for me. Oh, yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thanks to you both for um, joining us, Glenn, for providing some context around the Woods property and um, to Brad for just sharing your time and expertise on um, chum salmon. So uh, we're right at time here. So I think we're um, okay to wrap tonight's presentation up. Um, so I just uh, thank you for everyone for joining us and for your great questions uh, during tonight's event. Um, this work is really made possible by people like you. And if you were inspired by what's happening at Woods Landing to protect chum spawning grounds, I would encourage you to consider making a gift by visiting columbialandtrust.org slash donate. Um, this is our last event of 2020, believe it or not. Um, but we look forward to doing another series of virtual events beginning in January of next year. And you can check our website, social media to stay up to date on what the upcoming events are. And um, again, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you, Brad and Glenn. You're welcome. Good night, everyone. Good night.